Hey everybody, and uh, welcome to the Season 2, Episode 2 of Star Trek October. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in, we're a Star Trek Adventures actual play set in the year 2414 aboard a Starbase in the far reaches of the Sabine Expanse. Uh, what I would say is that this game is in the quote-unquote shared universe canon as Fenrir, Matahari, Groundskeepers, etc. You don't really need to have watched any of those to really enjoy October. But if you are interested in playing catch up, the VODs are available on my YouTube and most of the popular podcast solutions. Now, there are a few announcements this week, and then I'll get into shouting out people who sub during the start. Uh, the first announcement is that Star Trek Bastet uh, will have its first session this coming Saturday at 9 p.m. Eastern. And that will follow the adventures of a fresh from the Academy skeleton crew whose Prometheus class they were meant to deliver to the real crew gets flung through time. And we have the same players from Matahari coming over, and we also have uh, Matthew, or Lovecraft here, uh, also reprising a role. So it should be a pretty good time all around. Uh, please, I would love it if you came out and checked it out if you've got the time. Now, this second announcement kind of ties into that, is that um, assuming the world doesn't end in the next 24 hours, um, Cyberpunk 2077 goes live in like 20-some-odd hours. Uh, now, I don't plan on canceling any of my streams to actually do streams of it, which means that when I play it, it's largely going to be late into the evening and into the morning as far as the Eastern time zone is concerned. Now, if you're interested in that sort of thing, I would just say pop a follow, maybe follow me on, tw on tw uh, Twitter as well. Um, but it's mostly going to be an impromptu fashion. I'll be running when I am available to. Um, with that said, let me quickly give a shout out to the subs and whatnot, and then we'll have everyone introduce themselves. So, of course, we have Watney. Thank you. We have Soviet. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have Lily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's go around and have everyone introduce themselves, starting with Dag. Hey, everybody. I'm Dag. I am your Zaldan Captain Kijwick. Uh, on this session, I expect to die horribly and tragically. Uh, but if you want to talk about it, hit me up on Twitter at Trek Nexus. John, uh, you're next. John here. Uh, I play, I play Jaro Terrell, uh, the only person that isn't in an actual big vessel right now. Um, I'm in a little ship outside the big thing, and we'll see where that head, ends up. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Matthew. I play the Cation Engineer Lieutenant Jana, and uh, I will probably be desperately trying to save my best friend who is trapped in a shuttlecraft outside of our nice, safe, warm space station. Um, hey guys, I'm Aaron. I play Dr. Dotti, the Tellarite Chief Medical Officer, who will likely crab and grouse when he has two ten well, no two friends. jaros. Wow, hurtful. Okay, moving on. <laughs> and I'm Watney. I play a Station Security Chief, Lieutenant Commander Stetko, who is on the USS Umbriel outside the station at this moment. All right. And if you don't know me already, I'm ELH, the Game Master, and let's go ahead and run our introduction. And welcome back. So normally I would be having the players do an opening log, but since we sort of ended on a cliffhanger, I think I'm going to take this one. So to sort of catch everyone up to speed and to set the scene, in the aftermath of the captain's sanity testing ordeal, 
the mysterious old man revealed himself, saying that he had something of much importance to discuss. That something turned out to be a Sona Dreadnought from the 26th century that would accidentally send itself back to 2414 and end up fairly close to Deep Space October. Now, this was also important because this Dreadnought was equipped with a weapon capable of creating subspace tears across an entire sector. The mysterious old man advised capture and or destruction, then disappeared, as he seems to want to do. Now, the senior staff did their best to sort of pour through the data that they were given and to create a battle plan against such a hefty foe. Uh, between the help of the station's new AI, Athena, and the revelation that a certain admiral had placed transphasic torpedoes on the station, DSO's crew thought themselves ready. However, when the Dreadnought emerged, they were unable to stop it from firing its weapon. This, in turn, caused a massive subspace rift to open right off of the station. It's about then that everything went white. Doesn't matter where you are, whether you're on the station, the Umbriol, in a little fighter craft out on, you know, out in the depths of space. All your vision goes white. And some unknown amount of time later, you, the players, you're coming back to consciousness. Now, you're not where you were prior to the rift opening. You all appear to be aboard a wooden longship of sorts, gliding across a mist-covered sea towards a distant cliff face marked by cascading waterfalls and stone structures. Floating in the sky past these cliffs is Deep Space October and the Umbriel. Now, in terms of equipment, you only have your uniform, your comm badges, and a single tricorder among the lot of you. And to set the scene even further, let me change maps. That is more or less what you're looking at at the current moment. But yeah, you all are waking up on this longship. I'm going to let you guys take it from here. Uh, report. Computer and program. Yeah, Doc, I don't think that's going to happen. It was worth the try. <sighs> Uh, where are we? She's, so what do we have on us? Do we have like a tricorder? You have uh, your uniform, your comm badges, and a single tricorder among all of you. Who is currently holding the tricorder? I volunteer Captain Kiswick does. Hmm. I'll just open it and start scanning All right. since I have it. And, uh, so this doesn't look like heaven. But it's actually quite nice. So I, it, it's better than the other place, I would say. Well, I mean, <laughs> this could very well be the other place. Well, wasn't there an ancient human um, thing about crossing a river in the afterlife? Oh, yeah, that's in hell, right? So, I mean... There are rivers in pretty much every... I mean, Klingons, the Klingons have a river. I'm I'm from a water world. Rivers are our afterlife. It, if you get the good thing. If you get the bad thing, you get stuck out in space. Hmm. So, are you just constantly in hell when you're working? You have no idea. I think I do. <laughs> So, Kiswick, since you are scanning, uh, go ahead and roll me a reason science, please. Difficulty of zero. And uh, I don't think you've got to focus on this one, unfortunately. All right. Well, you don't get any momentum, but because it's difficulty zero, you still succeed. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and give you access to a handout. You should now see scans of question mark, question mark, question mark. Feel free to intersperse that knowledge. Mm. Doctor. I don't know. I got something off of this. <sighs> the tricorder is saying something about being in an interfold layer. Um, it's, it's a liminal space between reality and subspace. Um, we can't communicate with anybody and nobody can communicate with us because of plasma interference. Um, 
but uh, if anybody wants to give a chance at hacking our comm badges to a theta band, uh, we might be able to punch through that to reestablish contact with DSO or Umbriel. There's something in the tricorder here also about a reference uh, to uh, one of the Voyager missions. Uh, apparently their helmsman was able to return to normal space uh, from such a layer by riding through an astral eddy. I'm sorry, I really can't make sense of all of this stuff. Doc, Keswick will pass the tricorder over. And uh, real quick, a little bit more up, Dag. You are a little bit quiet. Uh, let's see. And the doc will tap the tricorder a little bit and sort of head over to um, Terrell and Jana and uh, say, well, based on these readings, we do seem to be within an interval layer. Now, if we want to reestablish communications, we may need to configure our communications to a theta band frequency, but the only problem is, is I don't know how we're going to do that with one tricorder and a comm badge. Well, we might be able to cannibalize a few of the communicators in order to create the tools necessary to actually affect a, uh, an inverse pulse through the nadion emitters within one of the remaining communicators. That might reorient it to allow us to communicate with the ship. Yes. Rick will hand his comm badge out to Jana. That could work, and if we couple that with uh, a widening of our communication bandwidth as much as we can, maybe we can daisy chain these communicators together to facilitate communication. It's possible. Um, although, is there any explanation as to why we're on a boat in the middle of a lake or river? Is Some that kind of transporter? I mean, it could be worse. We may not, we could not have the boat. So uh, Stetco is like scanning the water around the boat. It's, it's H2O. It's definitely water. Well, like visually and also to make sure there's nothing that's going to pop out. Okay. Uh, what I would say is uh, the water itself, now that you kind of inspect it a little bit, mm -hmm. um, it is remarkably clear. Like you can see all the way to the bottom and it's actually a pretty deep lake of some sorts. Um, if you had to guess, you're looking at a depth of maybe about 30 to 50 feet, somewhere around that area. And you even see like little fishes and, uh, you know, other bits of aquatic life sort of just doing their thing. No immediate threat, sir. I'm spending two threat at the moment you say that. Uh, a bass jumps out of the water, hits Kijrik in the face, and goes on the other side of the boat. <clears throat> because I find it funny. Mm. Are you all right, sir? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Charo it's just busts just... out. Apparently, <laughs> Interval uh, Space has a sense of humor. Something here has a sense of humor, <laughs> Did, uh, did you owe that bass some latinum? <laughs> Let, let's focus on the problem at hand before we get into my gambling problem, okay? You know, your wife is a counselor. She could probably help you with that. What makes you think she isn't? Okay, just... Uh, you know what they say about assuming, so... Uh, sorry about that. Let's get to shore. And what I would point out at this point, I maybe forgot to tell you, there are no oars on this sh this long ship. It is seemingly just being guided under its own power, but what that power is, you've got no idea. But it is moving. It is moving, yes. Okay. Towards land. Towards land, yeah. So <laughs> kind of looking at the uh, the picture it's I've got circles. on the screen right now. So you see where the uh, you've kind of got that gap between uh, two cliff faces. Uh, where the waterfall kind of comes down in the background, you're kind of coming into that area there. Is there a building on the cliff, or is oh that yeah, just... yeah, there is a uh, what seems to be a stone or some sort of na of man-made or intelligent construction uh, structure there. 
Um, vaguely reminiscent of um, maybe ancient Earth, I would say. Mm. So it looks like there's a building on the cliff, some sort of structure. I suppose we'll get there when we get there. Is there uh, any kind of warp? Sorry, that's not even a security person's question. I, I was about to ask, could I have a, a tricorder there, <laughs> ma'am? I'd like to scan for power signatures. Thank you. And uh, that is what I will do. I'll take the tricorder from Stetco. And then I'd like to essentially create a, a, a wide scanning field to see if we can detect any life forms or um, any power signatures, either from that uh, city or elsewhere surrounding us. Sure. Uh, go ahead and roll me a reason engineering difficulty of zero. And while uh, while that scan is happening, Kishwick will take another look into the sky to see if there's any activity between DSO, Umbriel, flashes of light. No, they're just sort of hanging there in the sky, not really How, moving or doing anything. Do they appear to be in orbit or do we appear to be between them? Are they super close? Uh, I would say that it would be the equivalent of seeing like a... Um, like a blimp at, at a sporting event where they're that sort of size in the sky. So they're fairly close, all things considered. Okay. All right. And with two successes, that's two momentum. So, Jana, there actually does appear to be a crude power source in that structure. Um, possibly some form of coal burning? Very crude thing, but it it does appear to be the case that there is a energy production, some sort of heat source coming from that structure. Uh, well, Captain, I think we can reasonably assume that there are life forms inside that building. I'm detecting some kind of rudimentary coal forge, perhaps, uh, useful for very, very rudimentary metallurgical processes, such as the forging of weapons or arms, um, which would actually be quite deadly for us since we don't have any advanced weaponry. Do what you can to reestablish communication with the station or the ship. And we'll keep our eyes out for anybody on the horizon. Uh, give me one second to deal with the dog. She wants something, but I don't. What? What? <laughs> hi. Yes. Hi. What do you so want? now we need a virtual avatar for the dog. Yeah. Apparently, we need something for the dog. What? You've been fed. You've been out. Do you just want attention? You, of course, don't answer me. All right. Um, talk amongst yourselves for like five seconds as I figure out what the hell she wants. Hearts in chat for the dog. Hearts in chat for the dog. <laughs> Good boys get hearts. Mm -hmm. oh, I wonder so, what uh, uh, Jaro just reaches over and <laughs> like splashes some of the water. Hey, careful with that. It's dangerous stuff. See, well, that's when... why I said it was your hell. Uh, we need Fair. to know if it's safe to drink. <clears throat> There's clearly oh. wildlife down there that we can eat if we have to resort to that. Jaro takes a drink. <laughs> now, I, I have to wonder, is this place, I don't know, a manifestation of our own minds? How are these, what is it, tertiary levels of subspace or whatever it is supposed to be? How, how do these things work? Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Uh, the reason the dog was upset was because there were bunnies in the backyard. Yes, folks, when you have a dog, apparently bunnies are a stream interrupting event. Now then you know. The next, the next question is matters. The important question is are there still bunnies in the backyard? No, because if I did let her out, she would probably have corrected that problem, but um, we let them live. We, we let bunnies live. <laughs> Anyways. That's, that's the good answer. Yes, that's, that's the desired answer. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, as you all are making progress uh, towards this structure, um, there's a sort of a, a rush of wind coming from your backs. And seconds later, you see and hear a gigantic flock of what are some form of white bird. You can't really tell if they're like a seagull or if they're like a hawk. You know, it's it's very hard to get a bead on these, these birds that are flying through the air, but uh, they sort of fly overhead uh, and go straight up to the highest tower of the structure ahead of you and sort of either nest or otherwise go inside the structure itself. Do you think those avians might be the indigenous life forms? I think it's a sign. 
we're on the right track. I almost feel like as if we're being guided. I don't think we really have a choice in which direction we're going. Uh, Jaro puts his feet up. I'm curious to know how Jaro got here. And Statko, weren't you on Umbriel? Yeah, we were all in different places. Bizarre. Just add that to the list. That's what makes me think there's some sort of consciousness at work here. Otherwise, we would be with any other crew member, not the senior staff of the station. Lieutenant Jana, any update on how long you'll need to see if we can punch through the plasma interference? Uh, well, sir, Starfleet engineers might have a reputation for turning rocks into replicators, but I'm working without any real tools here. <laughs> uh, a time frame is a little bit difficult for me to pro provide you. You're working without tools and you let that slow you down. I know, I should be able to turn the rocks into tools so that I can turn other rocks into replicators, but <laughs> I'm still Maybe. a rather young officer. Maybe when we get to shore, I can find you a stone knife or a bearskin. I don't really need the bearskin. I already have fur, but, you know, it's it's a nice thought, at least, sir. I'll, I'll take the bearskin. It may get cold. Um, GM, what's the uh, time-wise? Is it daylight, nightlight, twilight? Yeah, it's definitely daylight. I would say you kind of look up and you're actually not seeing a sun. You're not really seeing where light's coming from. But based on the general lighting, it's maybe somewhere close to midday, if you had to guess. But there's wind? There is wind, yeah. And does time seem to be moving consistently? <laughs> as mm, let other... me know how you would test that theory, and I will answer that I would question. be. She'd be looking at the sun. Well, there, there is no sun. sun. That's what I mean. Oh. Well, never mind them. <laughs> no discernible light it's just source. Just ambient light. Yeah, yeah, just a bunch of ambient light. Okay, so literally no way to tell time without some kind of clock. Well, sort of to speed things along. Eventually, your boat does come up to the base of the cliff face that houses the castle like structure. And the boat comes to a stop right in front of a wooden dock, allowing you to disembark uh, without getting yourself wet. And uh, waiting for you at the end of the dock, like the, the part of the dock that's on the shore, is a strange individual. Uh, she seems to be somewhere in the neighborhood of seven feet tall. Uh, she has uh, long, almost uh, crimson slash purple hued hair. Um, her eyes are uh, globes of the same color purple. And she seems to be wearing what would be classically described as almost uh, wizard-like or almost sort of mystical robes of some sort. And she sort of seems to just be standing there waiting, arms crossed, and waiting for you all to get off the boat to approach her. Uh, Jara, Jara's going to hop up. Uh, hello. Rick will also step out. And Seko will be very close. If not, almost trying to put herself directly between the captain and the lady. Makes sense. So, I'll uh, give you a token here to play with. Hmm. So, the uh, woman, whoever she might be, uh, sort of waits for you to come within normal speaking distance. And uh, she actually kind of sniffs the air as you get a bit close, and she frowns and says... Now, you aren't supposed to be here. How did you even get here? We were hoping you might be able to help us with that. Well, I might be able to. I'm assuming those are yours, and she points at DSO and the Umbreal in the sky. That's where we're from. I see. Well, how to put this... Are you familiar with the concept of Avalon? Um, <laughs> the faint memory from Earth? Indeed. And she points at Dottig. He might be able to tell you more. Uh, it's, it's, uh, 
mystical island, supposedly the burial place of a great warrior king, uh, King Arthur. Wait, the guy with the sword? I mean, one of them. I mean, yes. aren't like all people in these old myths, don't they all have like some kind of weird special sword? That... Yeah, but this is yeah. like the sword. Right. It's uh, Excalibur. Oh, uh, yeah. Hmm. You mean like the one the ship's named after? Right, yeah. That's the one. Humans. So, what about Avalon should we know? Well, I was sort of hoping that you being Starfleet, you would know the last crew I spoke with seemed to know the history of the place. Uh, perhaps I should give you my name. You may know me as Morgana Le Fay. Wait, the villainous? <laughs> she actually kind of <laughs>, laughs at that and says, I suppose that determines uh, what side of the myth you stand on. Yes, some would call me a villainous. Others would call me the one who saw King Arthur put to a peaceful rest. That sounds ominous. Well, let's just say that you being guests of Avalon is not something I had planned for, which means somebody brought you here. Somebody that was already here to begin with. And I can really only think of one person. Um, can can Stucco pick up any kind of empathic reading? Oh, yeah. She is both annoyed, but also amused. Okay. So keep that close to the gist. Who would that be? And uh, she does one of those things where she starts kind of swirling her hands uh, in front of her, and a Merlin? mystical sort of image, not unlike a hologram, uh, appears between her two palms, and it is quite literally a image of the mysterious old man. Is it Merlin? Hey, I Did you say that in character? No. <laughs> that's the... She wouldn't know that. <laughs> oh, boy. Cap, that's your elderly friend from... Yeah, we've seen him on the station several times. Mm. Well, that would certainly explain where he's been going on his little outings. Do you know who he is? Who he really is? Oh, he's been pretty elusive, but apparently he knows all of us and has kept an eye on us for some time. So if you are Morgana Le Fay, are you going to tell me that that old man is Merlin? Oh, look, we have a bright Tellarite with us today. Points for you. What are you implying? Well, let's just say the last Tellarite I talked with, uh, not the brightest bulb in the bunch. Wait, it's fair, you're, right? you're telling me exceptional. that you've had contact with the Federation in a realm that heretofore has been considered fictional. We've seen Stranger Things. Well, and the only thing a... I would say is that if you ever do get back up to your little station there, look at the adventures of the Akagi. You might find a reference to me. And how does a Tellarite know Arthurian legend so well? <laughs> she asks Dottick. Uh, a double minus B double plus in anthropology. Not for me. I guess that's fair. <laughs> okay. Um, how do we get back? Back to your station or back to real space? Because those are two entirely separate uh, questions Both. I have to answer. Both. Mm. Of course, it couldn't just be easy. It couldn't be, oh, Morgana Le Fay, I plead you for my assistance. And she kind of rolls her eyes and shakes her head. Very well. Uh, well, getting back to your vessel, station, whatever. That you just need tools for, because I imagine you have the capability of fixing your comm badges yourself. What do you need? And she looks actually very uh, very pointedly at Jana for this. What do you need tool-wise? Well, uh, I mean, I, I could use a microphase emitter in order to recalibrate the uh, theta band emitters in my communication device, but um, I don't know if you know what any of that is. Surprisingly, I actually do. 
And uh, she holds out her left hand, palm up, snaps her right fingers, and a device such as that appears in her hand. She just sort of holds it out to you. That is very considerate of you. Thank you, um, mm. ma'am. I'll um, just gingerly take that out of her hand. Yeah, and as you look at it, it's a uh, pretty proper tool. Seems to be a good repair. Could I get a medical tricorder? If you answer me one question. Very well. Who do you think is really the villain of the whole Arthurian legend? Hmm? Be honest. It's very important to be honest. Well, I mean, it really all depends on the version of the narrative that uh, that you've heard. And for my you're part, I for don't... Time. Well, if you must know, for my part, I don't actually believe that you're Morgana Le Fay. Uh, I don't actually believe that this is Avalon. I don't actually believe any of it is real. I believe that you are a subspace entity and that we are trapped in an interfold layer. Can't those two things be the exact same thing? Well, you've got me there. Somebody note that for the log. <laughs> and she actually kind of smiles and does produce a medical tricorder and hands it over to you. Perfect. I will immediately scan her. <laughs> All right. Go ahead and roll me a reason medicine difficulty of two. <laughs> Reason, medicine. And you might have a focus here. I'm looking at your focuses now. Uh, I've got xenobiology. I, I give you xeno. Xeno is the one I was looking at. Okay. Uh, you know what? I'm going to try to get us a little bit of momentum. So I'm going to use a, a, a point of momentum to buy an extra die. Okay. And. Ooh. Well. I have good news and bad news. The good news is you got the number of successes. The bad news is you rolled a complication. Mm -hmm. With that extra die that you bought. <laughs> yeah. That's a groundskeeper's move right there. That is a classic groundskeeper. Well, John move. took all of our good rolls over there. No. I had one good roll. Yeah, I was going to say that was his that was one a, good that roll. That was a really good roll, though. Just the... All right. So here's what happens. And again, this is me being a little silly, but, you know, we're, we're here for laughs. So Dottig, you run a scan of her, and yeah, um, I don't know if you in character have ever looked up what a Q looks like on uh, a tricorder. It's not the same. She's not a Q, you know that much. But she is something along the lines of like a Dowd. Or aka the Q-like entity that was capable of erasing the entire species from existence, etc., etc. Uh, but the complication is, is as you make that face and start to say something, another bass leaps out of the water, hits the tricorder out of your hand into the water. Were you about to say something, Doctor? Well, I was about to ask if our gracious hostess is a Dowd. A Dowd. Oh, yes, one of those. No, not exactly the same thing, but uh, close enough for your comprehension. Well, oh, and I do apologize about my fish. Um, they get very feisty this time of day. Not that time matters here. Right. But you are, if not a doubt, not a cue, certainly, but a uh, what we would describe as a paracausal entity. Ah, that's a very good word for it. Points for you. Here. And she hands you another tricorder. Don't lose that one. Just gonna strap it in his his belt. Uh, if I may, just pose a question as I'm working on recalibrating these communication devices. Um, why are we here? I mean, I presume that your adversary, this Merlin, has brought us here for some reason, perhaps as part of some kind of Machiavellian plot to undermine you or the like. Do you have any idea what that might be? Well, I have a hunch, and for the record, we're not really enemies or. We don't hate each other. We're um, more uh, friendly competitors is how I would flavor it. Forgive me for the, my misunderstanding about your, the nature of your relationship. I, I'm sorry about that. but uh... No, you're fine. I don't mind it at all. In fact, this is the most time I've had for conversation in over a century. So this is actually kind of nice. 
Let's uh, let's put this in terms you might understand. Are you familiar at all with the adventures of the Fenrir? It was a Starfleet vessel, if I remember correctly. Uh, heard of it? Yes. Well, let's just say that at one point they encountered um, another mythological creature. This one from a different author, Mister Lovecraft, I believe was his name. Okay. And you're saying that essentially all these authors have some kind of connection with this kind of interphasic layer of space or another kind of interphasic layer of space, and they're just channeling that as part of their writings? Well, you are the engineer here. Is subspace not an infinite honeycomb of possibilities? That's, that's more of a question that you ask for a, a science officer. But yes, uh, insofar as I understand it, that is an accurate description. Uh, it's something of an oversimplification. But in any event, I believe you actually have a visitor. And she kind of turns and uh, points out a large white bird. This time, the bird is definitely recognizable as some form of an eagle. Um, but instead of like the white and brown, it is pure white and its size is easily the size of like a pickup van that you might find in real life. So you've got this giant bird flying in your direction. Tricorder say anything about giant birds in Avalon? I'm a guess that that's would be a no. no. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Hello, giant bird. Yeah. So assuming you all just kind of stay there and wait, I did want to give you that option to maybe run or hide or, you know. Uh, with you staying where you are, the bird comes in, uh, lands a little bit ways away, and uh, literally shapeshifts into a familiar face. Mr. Mysterious Old Man. Uh, difference, though, is that instead of wearing his sort of like baggy and tattered um, earth style clothing, he is wearing a garment similar to Morgana is. And he actually has like a white staff uh, that he's carrying as well. And he says, ah, good, you you've you've made it. I was worried you might get lost. Why did you bring us here? Well, two reasons. First of all, you kind of failed. You let them let the Sona fire the weapon, which contemporarily means that they just destabilize the entire Sabine expanse with a rift. Well, you know, it wasn't for lack of trying. Oh, no, no. In fact, that's why I even brought you here to begin with. Let's just say that um, time doesn't flow the same way here as it does elsewhere. And Morgana kind of rolls her eyes at that, but the mysterious old man continues. What I mean to say is, here, time is timeless. I can send you forward. I can send you back. Give you a second chance, as it were. You sound like an echo from the Nexus? Can't say I'm familiar with this Nexus, but... Let's just say the second reason I brought you here is a little closer to home. Well, is there something okay. you need from us, maybe? Are you going to send Santa Claus with some weapons so we can save, slay a witch and save Narnia? And I thought he was Santa Claus. Morgana actually bursts out laughing at that and says, no, 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 no. Santa Claus is a fey creature, different subspace manifold. Too rich for my blood. Are you telling us that because of the timelessness of this place that we have a chance to undo the rift in the Sabina Spance? You do, yes, answers Merlin. But how can we go back and change anything if we don't know the motives for it in the first place? Ah, well, I guess that means that you have somewhere to start once you're sent back. How and what drove the Sona to, to make such a weapon? What drove the Sona to fire it without even talking to you? Interesting questions, don't you think? 
what if in going and researching this, we cause the reasons why the Sona try to stop us? And wouldn't this result in some kind of temporal causality loop if we went back in time and then prevented the Sona from firing the weapon? We never would have ended up here in the first place in order to go back in time to stop them. Let's just say the multiverse has a way of correcting itself. I find that answer vague and unconvincing. Well, I would explain it, but you would be here for, well, longer than your lifespans. Now you understand why I didn't take the temporal mechanics elective at the Academy. Well, sounds like a good the, choice. From the sounds of it, neither did John, though. Doc? Did you hmm? D-double plus out of the temporal mechanics class? <clears throat> oh, I didn't take it either. Okay. <laughs> All right, so you got six grunts with there, five, one, two, three, five grunts with no experience with paradox. So can we really hold ourselves liable for anything that changes the timeline if we have no idea what we're doing in the first place? Well, Technically, I, think that's I went five. to the temporal mechanics uh, class, but I didn't pay much attention. Was that just because you had that girl you were into? Yes. <laughs> were you going to go forward in time and to try to figure out if you got married or not? Uh, no, it was... It's just, you know, it's the same reason I you, took women's studies. You didn't date much when you were younger, did you, Captain? Um, no. Yeah, okay. All right. How is this going to work? Merlin sort of smiles and uh, points up at DSO. I can send you back to 24 hours before all this went down. Now, of course, you will retain the knowledge that you gained in that time span. You will retain anything that you have learned. Everyone else, though, everyone on DSO, including those that are up there right now, will have no memory of this event. You five will be the only ones that know. But we don't know anything more than we did when we started. So what knowledge do we have that can possibly help Unless you're about to hand us some kind of knowledge Excalibur or something. Hmm. No, not quite, but I am willing to provide a hint, if you will. In Whoa. exchange for... <laughs> ah, see? We have someone catching on already. I will give you a hint. In exchange, I would like you to take someone back with you. Someone from here? Yes. You see, um, and he actually kind of looks at uh, Morgana and Morgana rolls her eyes and says, all right, so let's just say that technically only the sinless may enter Avalon. Well, what that means is Mr. Merlin here, and she kind of shoots him daggers, and I more or less can only leave for short periods of time. However, Mr. Merlin decided to um, take a page out of my book and make a homunculus. And he's gotten attached to it. So you want to explain that one, big guy? And Merlin actually laughs kind of from the belly and says, <laughs> yes, yes, I, I have a daughter I'd like you to take back with you. You you want us to take your golem back to our reality? Well, that is what Starfleet does, is it not? You seek out new life. I think this is a perfect example of such. No, I'm in full agreement. Is this creation of yours some kind of mechanical contrivance or the product of your own bizarre powers that result in a biological organism? And it's one of those things that, Jana, you say that, and then you feel a tap on your left shoulder. She's right behind me, isn't she? Mm -hmm. And everyone else, it's almost the same fashion, the way the mysterious old man or Merlin appeared. And... There's a woman, a uh, little bit shorter than Morgana, um, stark white hair, kind of done in a bob cut, wearing the same sort of Merlin-like robes. Um, but when you look at her, she doesn't have the same aura as, quote-unquote, Morgana does. Like, Morgana, you look at her and you think, oh, she's an ominous witch. This individual you look at and think, oh, she's just uh, an apprentice or a kid playing adult kind of a thing. Uh Hello. Uh, I'm sorry if that question was in any way offensive. It probably should have been directed at you in a more tactful way. Um, <clears throat> uh, Jonna, pl pleasure to make your acquaintance. 
And she uh, kind of tilts her head to the side and says, ah, you know what? I, I read about this once. This is what we would call a first contact, isn't it? Quite apt, yes. <laughs> ah, I am a, I'm Brictavi, or Brictiva. Thank, nice to meet you. Likewise, very much so. And uh, Merlin just sort of laughs a little bit himself and Morgana just sighs and says, all right, can we, can we get this show on the road? I, I have things to do. Uh, no offense, sir, but um, if you're sending your daughter back with us, don't you want to ensure her safety? Shouldn't you give us some kind of information as to how we might actually defeat the Sona? With our current level of technological advancement and weapons, we can't really defeat them quickly enough in order well, to prevent them from activating their subspace weapon. Yeah, I mean, I was I was in there. I was basically stuck to their hull and, uh, you know, direct hit the whole works and just wasn't enough. Well, let's just say I have utmost confidence that you'll do it right this time. What if you put us on the dreadnought instead of the station? I could do that. However, I think it is more Starfleet of you to find a nonviolent solution to this. That's no fun. <laughs> You did say that this entire realm allows us to transcend the limitations of, well, temporal existence. Could you perhaps deposit us in the 26th century and then return us to our own time? Hmm. I was wondering to see if anybody would make that leap of logic. Yes, I can do such a thing. Uh, well, far be it for me to make any untoward suggestions, Captain, but that might be a reasonable starting point, the place where everything actually began. If it indeed began there, going to visit the Sona in the 26th century and perhaps learning a little bit more about the politics that led them on such a desperate gambit could help us undo some damage. Anybody opposed to the idea of taking a ride into the future? Uh, well, other than the tech, uh, other than the, you know, the regulations around it. But yeah, you're the captain. What choice do we have? Take us to the Sona, if they have a home world or base, two weeks prior to the departure of their warship. All right. So it's not Merlin or Morgana that answers, but it's uh, Bractiva next to Jana that uh, produces her own staff and sort of waves it in the air. And in the air before you opens up, not unlike a view screen, showing not a planet, but what appears to be an asteroid field with some form of dry dock in it. And as you see this, uh, you begin to hear voices as if coming through the ether. And it takes a little bit for your universal translators to pick it up and chi you know chime it through to whatever language you are speaking, Federation Common, quote unquote. But you begin to hear the following. Damn it, I told you, there is no way we're getting back our homeworld. Well, that's because you're short-minded. If we blow up the Federation enough that they have no choice but to let us have our homeworld back, we don't have to be the outcasts thriving on artificial radiation. There you go again with your crazy crackpot theories that we'll be able to just get our homeworld back. Well, it's better than sitting around doing nothing. And the conversation continues back and forth like that. Uh, you get the sense, though that you have heard this argument before. And I think Terrell and Stetko, if I remember correctly from last session, um, you all were looking up Sona culture, if I remember correctly. Is that about right? Uh, I was not. You were not, right. okay. Probably somewhere along the way, since we were so desperate, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was just Stetko. So Stetko, I'd like you to roll me an insight and a command here, difficulty of two. And you I'd do probably... have one momentum, you may wish to spend it. Of 
forensic science. <laughs> Honestly, I think that could apply here. I could see a reason for it. Okay, I'll spend a momentum and roll three too. Look at that. That's nice. four successes. So you get two momentum back. Stetko, you've heard this argument before, and it all, almost stretches all the way back to the Federation's encounter with them that led to the, shall we say, um, abandonment of their home world. Uh, by that, I mean specifically the events of Star Trek Insurrection. Um, the Sona in the 26th century are those that did not return to their planet. They're the ones that continue to be nomads, continue to be bitter that they couldn't have their planet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, now, what that helps you, let's just say that that same mindset they had in Insurrection as seems to be almost the exact same they have in the 26th century. Okay. Um, so how does she know that this is related to Insurrection? I would say that looking up cultural studies of the Sona, that okay. is how, because that the Sona were kind of prominently displayed at insurrection. Yeah. Uh, before okay. that, they were, I forget the name of the species, but they were just kind of a singular species. Okay. So she's hearing this conversation go down and she recognizes that it's like the same mentality of years past. Mm -hmm. Is that, would that be accurate? Yeah. Uh, would she also know that they were, um, infertile yes okay and and what's this what's the setting like are they still on the are they still on the are they on the island on avalon or are they like i'm sorry if there was they're a on a station? space station in an asteroid okay. field okay so they're on the station and so is she hearing this like beyond a door or something nearby well you're you're seeing it through the pseudo view screen okay projection okay um Sir, this is this is them. Desona from uh what was the planet in insurrection? Baku. Baku. Yeah. Yep. Baku. <laughs> I don't know how they survived given that they were last we heard from them they were infertile, but this is them. I'm pretty familiar with the Sona. They were working on variants of Ketracel White during the Dominion War. They were selling it as a narcotic. We were trying to figure out a protein sequence that would render it neutral and kill the Jemadar at the time, but it didn't pan out. Jemadar medical, th sorry, uh, Sona medical technology was highly advanced, which explains how they were actually able to synthesize Ketracel White when even the Dominion was having difficulty doing so in the Alpha Quadrant. It may be that they found some kind of cryogenic technology that was able to preserve them or something that could extend their lifespans. That's more the doctor's field of expertise, though. And to agree, he did say that they had been relying on artificial radiation. And at the time of the encounter, they were trying to exploit radiation around the planet Baku to regenerate them. Yes, well, I believe you're referring to metaphasic radiation. Yeah. Um, to this day, we are still unable to replicate it artificially. It's... Uh... Nothing short of miraculous if they succeeded in any small measure. I don't know if we ever successfully established any colonies on Baku to explore the natural healing properties without having to catalyze the radiation in the rings. But it might be possible that if we not necessarily return to those events, but go to Baku and see if there can be a peace or a forgiveness worked out that the Sona could establish a colony far away enough from the Baku to not be harmed, but to heal. Is that doing too much? I mean, I feel like our interference here should be minimal. I may interject real quick. Uh, John, I'm looking at Terrell's uh, focuses here. Mm -hmm. I think there's an argument here that based on the fact you have power systems, uh, starship construction, and weapon systems, I think at this point there is cause for Terrell to begin thinking of an idea 
uh, specifically involving the weapon that was fired at the station. Um, now, I can either give you this hint, OC, or if you'd like to roll for it for the chance at momentum, um, I would say that this would be a reason and a engineering. Uh, the difficulty on this would be a four, though. Uh, uh, all right, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and do it. All right. Um, I'll use my. We'll use determination um, with uh, something to prove. OK. Do you want those two momentum as well? Yeah. Survey says five successes. Five. Very nice. You get a momentum back. So Terrell, you know, maybe you don't know the whole story behind the Sona. Maybe that's just not Terrell's thing. But what you do know is that during your 24 hour stint where you were researching it with Janna and uh, Athena, what you remember seeing is a sort of a fringe theory. You know, some random scientist somewhere wrote something down, it got published, and then it was forgotten for all time. But you remember seeing somewhere that there might be the possibility of converting the isolytic weapon like the discharge of it into metaphasic radiation. Okay. So, you, you know, all the stuff we were going through there, Jana, when we were looking at ways to deal with this, I, I saw something, but it, at the time it really didn't mean anything to me, but I think we might be able to convert the energy. You mean use the isolated subspace weapon that they've been developing to actually create a wellspring of this metaphasic radiation that they need to survive? Mm -hmm. Would it be permanent? I ask no. because the logs recorded that the effect of the radiation on the Enterprise crew was fleeting when they left the Briar Patch. But if they, this, oh, sorry, go ahead. They would need continual exposure to new sources of radiation, but if the weapon could be modified, it might be limitless. You almost create it into a generator of sorts. <laughs> Doctor, you were going to say? I was going to say the potential medical benefits, not only for the Sona, but for the Federation, if this theory proved true is incalculable. I'm curious about the negative impact. We don't want another Genesis on our hands. Well, and who's to say the radiation will remain stable? Not my area of expertise, but. But the good point. It is all highly theoretical. Yeah, that's why I didn't even bring it up originally. Um, just didn't seem it it's actually a novel idea jaro i'm just curious about how isolytics are already a unpredictable energy that's why they were outlawed we also have to consider that from the historical graphical records of the uh the sona they seem to be driven more by a desire for revenge than a desire for their own survival that solution might not actually give them what they're really looking for. Well, well the next question is, if even if we pursued that path, what kind of equipment would you need to make this and how, are, where would we need to go to do that? GM, would we be able to affect those kinds of uh, alterations to the ship at October or even uh, on the ship itself? What I would say is you would have to build something like a lightning rod for either the station or the ship, which would then turn the energy into something else. It is possible, but just remember, you have 24 hours to build it once you go back. 
I mean, if nothing else, what we're looking at is the potential of being able to disperse the weapon at, at minimum. Garo, Jana, I'm not an engineer, but I am no, that's true. quite I am quite frankly brilliant. Mm. Humble too. Very much so, thank you for noticing. Mm. But I had a, a thought. If we could convert the isolytic energy into radiation, what if we could convert the isolytic rip into energy? Consider for a moment the missions of the USS Enterprise D and their encounter of aceton assimilators. Those devices could convert energy into radiation and vice versa. What if we use the isolytics as a source of power to strengthen our own defenses while we hold the sona at bay? Could it work? Yeah, drawing inspiration from the booby trap that the Enterprise encountered, uh, functionally doing the same thing. It's possible, but again, we have a limited time frame in which to actually affect this kind of construction project on the station. Well, I mean, we are in a place where time is timeless. Can just somebody get us maybe a drafting table or a calculator? I kind of need a supercomputer for that, like the cryonural gel packs on board the station, but I do appreciate the, your confidence in my abilities to be able to perform that kind of operation on a pencil and piece of paper. And I think because I find it funny, there's a loud thunk, and Jono, you maybe even leap a little bit as Morgana Le Fay puts a table with pen and paper in front of you and just smiles. Um, this whole thing about this realm being timeless, um, does that mean that we're not going to age here? Because this is going to take me about 150 years, and most of our species don't actually have that kind of lifespan. I mean, what is that in cat years? I don't know. I'm not really a cat. Well, technically speaking, and uh, Jaro looks up, our ships are here. All we need to do is get up there. 24 hours. I mean, 24 hours when we get back to real space. Mm -hmm. Potentially I longer mean, if we stay yeah, here. Yeah, if we can just get up to the ships and stay here, we have everything at our disposal up top. And Jana at this point would turn over to uh, uh, Brictavia. Um, would we be able to impose on you? I mean, this is uh, maybe I should be asking your father this kind of question, but can we remain here in order to affect these kinds of, well, the development of these schemes? And she kind of looks between you and Merlin, looks, you know, kind of does a triple take almost, and uh, eventually says, I think you might be able to get a few extra hours but the problem is with remember how Morgana there said only the sinless may enter Avalon oh yeah that's not us yeah I have no well, idea why I'm here let's just say you all are still affected by time but your ship and station up there are essentially in stasis they aren't actually experiencing time at all Uh, uh. Well, I mean, we've we've done the impossible before, Jana. Uh, actually, um, would it be possible for us to take a nap before we leave? I mean, I hate to ask, but we were just up for twenty four hours preparing for this before. <laughs> yeah, uh. and I'm pretty damn tired. And I don't want to go back and spend another 24 hours working on this. I'm just short rest. <laughs> I uh, I think I pretty much all the three, Bractiva, Morgana, Merlin, they all sort of laugh. And Morgana says, oh, this is stupid. You're stupid, Merlin. Fine, fine. I'll put you up for the night or whatever you want to call it here. Okay. And and yeah, I think with that, we're uh, we're going to take our 10-minute uh, break. And when we come back, we're going to see if the crew can do the impossible. So yeah, we'll be back shortly.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we took a little bit longer break there because uh, the players needed a little bit more time to brainstorm. But I believe they have a uh, course of action where to go from here. So, uh, Captain, take it away. Jonna, Terrell, Dottig, I need you guys to develop that idea that you had about converting the isolytic radiation into metaphasics that can help the Sona. If, I, if we plan this right, we might be able to undo the tear itself right when it's about to happen, which will minimize impact on the timeline because since we technically didn't experience any isolytic fractures throughout our space, maybe they haven't happened yet. Stedko, how's, uh, how's your interstellar law? Quite good, sir. My plan is, is gonna be try to be twofold here. Um, if you guys can get the metaphasic converter in place, we'll have two aces up our sleeve because Stetko and I are gonna take a trip. We're gonna try to go to Baku 24 hours before the tear and we will lobby the Baku leadership to see if they would be willing to accept a Sona colony on Baku for the purpose of healing that divide. Any objections? Uh, it's not our place to object, sir. <clears throat> well, it's always your place to object. That's why I got yourself. you on my station. <laughs> Hopefully the shortness of the time difference will leave minimal ripple effects in the continuity of our linear timelines. 
I have a sneaking suspicion that if we can get 25th century Baku and Sona to reunify, our 26th century problem will solve itself. And All right. 40 years after the last attempt, maybe both sides are ready to try again. Maybe. You three go back to the station. If all goes well, I'll see you in 23 and a half hours. Brictava, if you could uh, take me and Commander Stetko to the Baku homeworld 24 hours before we came here, that'd be much appreciated. Sure. Just uh, keep in mind, uh, I'm not like Dad here. I don't have an inf infinite battery for this sort of thing. I, I will need a little bit of time to recharge. 23 and a half hours be enough time? We'd be cutting it close, but it should be enough. Well, that's good, because if memory serves, the Briar Patch is on the other side of the quadrant from Deep Space October. All right, everybody. You know the mission. The fate of DSO hangs in the balance, as well as plenty of interstellar species that would like to maintain their interstellar attributes. Let's get this done. It's again one of those things where once the plan has been decided and you all have indicated that you're ready, your vision goes white again. And we're going to start with the uh, brain trust first, I think. Where Terrell, Jana, Dottig, you come back to yourselves in the science lab of Deep Space October. Uh, Athena is there halfway through saying something, and she'll just sort of pause and say, Um, sorry? Um, am I boring you? Uh, uh it, no, uh, it's that, uh, well, we just came back in time from 24 hours in the future. These, this, you, you get used to these kind of weird things happening. So just uh, roll with that, okay? You probably have been up to... Doctor, maybe we should... Oh, no, I was, I was there too. And if you use the internal sensors, you'll notice that we're probably uh, displaying uh, higher than normal levels of uh, chronoton saturation. She sort of narrows her eyes and says... No, actually, I'm not. Hmm. Okay, look, when either like the Q or the Dowd or any of those other like 15 different omnipotent races that Captain Kirk encountered are involved, weird things happen. Maybe there's not evidence of these occurrences, but trust us. I'm your second favorite fleshling after all, right? So yeah you got me something. there wait how do you know okay you must be from time because I, I haven't said that out loud yet oh, okay you know what i needed empirical evidence and there it was cool i was really surprised to learn about the the favorite one of yours but uh you know we'll keep that on the down low she gets like dangerously close to her at least her hologram and goes and says not one fucking word or i will put your personal logs on blast throughout subspace wow one word about what <laughs> <laughs> good kitty now, uh, what are we working on? Uh, doctor, I mean, you probably understand the science involved here a little bit better than I do, even though I'm the one making the alterations to the station. Right. So basically what we want to do is take the, the principle of an aceton assimilator and translate that to the station. And instead of trapping radiation, we'll be trapping isolytic energy. Is that uh, too complicated for you, Athena? Do you want me to slow down and use smaller words? No, I followed. I followed. The GM was uh, missing with something <laughs> offhand. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, so uh, well, this is, of course, going to be an extended task. Uh, this is probably going to be the most difficult extended task that I can throw at you, but I think the rewards are justified. So you're going to have a work track of 20, a magnitude of five, a difficulty of five, a resistance of two, and you have uh, about 24 hours remaining. Uh, and every single attempt is going to be a baseline of four hours unless you spend momentum or threat to the contrary. So we're going to tackle this one of a few ways. 
Uh, if Jana or Terrell is doing it, uh, you guys are doing Daring Engineering's. Dottig, if you're doing it, I could see arguments for Daring Science or Daring Medicine. And of course, if Athena assists you, it's probably going to be a control and probably a medicine or science on her end. Now, what exactly is the task that we're attempting to undertake? I know that we're trying to construct this, uh, this device, but what does that actually entail in terms of a modification to the systems on the station? Is it a, a kind of uh, alteration to the deflector grid that is actually going to draw in energy or the like it could be having yeah a i probably should that. it might help but you have to excuse me again i have a dog distracting me it's fine um basically what it is or at least the way <laughs> i imagine it is you pretty much said it yourself you're going to modify the deflector to turn it into a lightning rod and then what you do with that energy is entirely up to you but you have to first make the lightning rod before you can do anything with the energy so Here's me trying to game the system and make use of all of my talents. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to, if possible, spend one momentum to get a magnetic probe, which will help me to reroute the plasma conduits leading into the deflector to channel the excess energy. Okay, I'm allowing it. That would allow me to get two benefits because of my uh, talent, which is the right tool for the right job. Mm -hmm. So it would lower the difficulty by two. Okay, that would mean it would be a difficulty three. Then I'd like to use mental repository to lower it one more time by taking two intervals. Okay, so that would be uh, 12 hours, but you would be rolling at a difficulty of two. So Sorry, uh, not, not 12 hours, eight, eight. hours. Because two intervals would be, because each interval is four hours, so two intervals would be eight hours. Okay, and then I would spend determination, one momentum, and one threat to get two free successes and roll an extra die as well. Sure. Okay. So after all that weird chicanery and mm -hmm. background magic, uh, that was a reason engineering? Uh, daring engineering. Daring engineering. Okay. Well, it's the same thing for me. So uh, 320 power systems. Yeah. Yeah. That, that definitely applies here. All right, well, that's three successes. You only needed the uh, two thanks to your uh, masterful use of the system, so you actually get a momentum back. Uh, you would be rolling seven challenge dice on this. Uh, does it, Was anyone assisting me there? Oh, but... right, we do have to get an assist. Uh, Dottig, uh, Terrell, do you guys want to throw in an assist? Sure. I mean, there is. I was waiting for John to volunteer. Good. There you go. That way the... No pressure, right? Well, it's just, I mean, you saw my first roll. There you go. Well, there you go. Another two successes. You're actually up to three momentum. Very nice. All yeah. right. Yeah. Let's see those. Okay. So nice. that's eight successes. Uh, do you want to spend any momentum for piercing or anything like, or you just want to keep the eight? Uh, the resistance was two. So that would be two breakthroughs, right? Uh, yeah, so even without spending momentum, you would do six work and get two breakthroughs on this. Then I think I would just go for that. Okay. So uh, it is one of those things where uh, not only do you have the right tool for the right job, but you are more or less along the lines of thinking that, you know, hey, if I reroute this here and if I recalibrate, recalibrate the manifold here, um, you more or less make almost a mockery out of the monumental task ahead of you to the point that, sure, it takes you a little bit longer, eight hours, uh, but eight hours later, you are pretty much almost halfway done with this task. Okay, well, I've got engineering teams on decks 17 through 22 rerouting plasma conduits throughout the entire station. Um, we should be able to channel the power through the deflector grid. It's the only system on the ship that's designed to actually carry that much energy. Um, but doctor, I think I'm going to need your help in the actual science involved in the alteration between the metaphasic energy and the, uh, the, uh, the waveform of the isolytic subspace weapon. Well, that is going to be the heart of this part. Um, although... I believe that we have detailed scans in the ship's library from the Enterprise computer's scans. 
of an aceton emitter that should give us a reasonable baseline to start from, uh, theoretically. All right, Dotig, I think you got to take the lead on this one. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to be a reason and a science, difficulty of three. And uh, I believe you have a focus here. And you still have a determination. <laughs> yep. I do. Should we spend one momentum to reduce the interval? Hmm, yeah. I, yeah, since we yeah, since we took two intervals the last time, let's let's reduce the interval this time. All right. Um I will yeah, I'll tap a value here. Um and yeah, I'll use um first do no harm being acutely aware that if any part of this uh theoretical work is incorrect or the practical is incorrect, then basically everybody on the station is going to be dead. Yeah, that's uh, a fair and, use of it. Uh, and yeah, at that point. Here we go. Reason. Survey says. And who's assisting? Up to you. Oh, you are. Okay. Well, very nice. nice. That's already six successes. And there's the complication. Ah. So uh, six successes means you get three momentum. Uh, I'm going to actually bank that complication for later. Oh, good. But uh, Jana, or no, sorry, Dottig, you're rolling me six challenge die to represent how much work you get done. Okay. And once we do that, we'll switch over to the other part of the away team to see how they're doing. All right, I'm going to... Can I uh, spend a, a point of momentum to reroll those zeros? Certainly, Mag. All right. That's going to be four. That is a significant difference. So that is nine total. Uh, do you wish to spend any momentum on piercing or no? Uh, yeah, I think it's 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 one for two, right? Correct. And we have a resistance to two. Yeah, so I'll spend a point of momentum. All right. So... Uh, actually, once you get your hands dirty, quote unquote, and start delving into the theory, um, you think you have a path forward here. It takes a little bit of creative thinking. You almost have to treat the Starbase's EPS conduits and the, how it's tied to the deflector uh, to, say, the human nervous system or a humanoid nervous system. But you think you're on the right track, which is where this is going. But uh, as you are working on this, we're going to switch scenes. Uh, and I'm just going to put you guys in theater of the mind for this one. But Kijwick, Stetko, Riktiva, you arrive on the surface of an alien planet, specifically the one that the Sona originated from. And you emerge on the top of a hill looking down towards the village. Uh, which is supposedly actually looks rather well kept. Um, doesn't appear to be all that bit all that high tech, but uh, you know it's, it's it's a reasonable abode, is what I would say. What's the weather like? Oh, it's a it's a nice balmy seventy six degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you know, sun in the sky, few clouds, nice breeze out of the south. Ooh, hotter than I thought it would be. Let's make our way down into the village, but try to appear as non-threatening as possible. We're here to strike a peace, not scare people. Hopefully the bad taste Starfleet left in their mouths has long disappeared. So it actually doesn't take you long before uh, somebody spots you, and when they spot you, uh, they immediately drop what they were doing and go running for the nearest building. And after maybe a few more minutes of you walking towards the village, uh, you just hear and see door after door shutting and one particular individual staying outside. And uh, it does... Uh, you're going to recognize them out of character, but in character, you have no idea who it is that stays outside. Um, they actually look rather well for their age. Uh, they are kind of a middle-aged individual, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 
well, if I had to guess, uh, about 60 or 70. But uh, for a Baku, he looks actually really nice. Maybe that's because of all the metaphasic radiation in the area. Kiswick will put his hands out to the side, palms forward. Hello, I'm Captain Kiswick of Starbase Deep Space October. I'm, I'm looking for Sojef. And uh, the gentleman sort of looks you up and down, sort of narrows his eyes and says, what does Starfleet need with him? Well, we kind of have forewarning of a crisis. Um, there's a Sona ship en route to my station right now with the intent to destroy it and open an isolitic rift in the area that will cause all warp travel to be inoperative through that region. I was hoping to speak to Sojef about gaining a truce and to see if the offer that was given 40 years ago for the Sona to resettle on Baku is still in effect. Well, so Jeff is otherwise indisposed at the moment. Uh, maybe I can facilitate what you need. Uh, I'm Golna. It's Dana's... nice to meet you. Yes. And then Zaldin standard will put a webbed hand on his shoulder and squeeze it as the standard greeting. Okay. What kind of reading is Stetco getting from him? You can sense that this is maybe almost like a hero complex is how I would flavor it, where maybe Sojef is really available, but maybe Golna just wants to sort of make up for past wrongdoings. Perhaps we can discuss a, a means for a truce between your two people to bring you together again. I am certainly willing to discuss such a thing with uh, my counterpart. I, uh, I would only ask, uh, how would we be returning to your station exactly? I... You didn't come in on a shuttlecraft, and as far as I know, there's no ships in orbit, so... Our friend here, and Kizrik will motion to Brickdiva, mm -hmm. uh, has the ability to return us to the station, should any of your envoys be willing to return with us. I'll see who I can round up. And yeah. Shall we wait here or go with you? Stay here. We don't want to spook anyone else. We will do that. Thank you. And as he runs off, probably to actually confer with So Jeff to make sure he really can just sort of take his place kind of a thing. Um, we're actually going to transition back to the science team where uh, at this point, uh, you guys really only need uh, either six work done or... Uh, really just one breakthrough. So I guess, yeah, if you do five work, uh, you complete this extended task. And at this point, it's just a matter of applying the science. You just have to put science into practice. So this would be, if this was Dottig, this would be a control science. If this was Jana, control engineering. Terrell, control engineering. Athena, control whatever. Uh, I think we need two more breakthroughs, right? So... I'll right, but if you do five work, that's one breakthrough, but you also complete the work track, so that right. there's your second breakthrough. Right. Do you want to go for this, Jaro? You are muted, John. You're better equipped for it. Sorry, I was muted. Okay. Then... Uh... John will attempt to calibrate the uh, device that we have now uh, installed in the deflector in order to appropriately uh, aggregate the energy. All right. Corel will assist, though. Okay. Uh, I will spend one momentum to reduce the interval and one momentum to buy an extra die. Noted. 
All right. Well, you get the two successes you need, and you get me. Well, let's see what Terrell's assist is first. All right. So you do get the two successes you need. Now, can you get me at least five work done? Is the question. So seven challenge dice. Yep, seven challenge die. Yeah, you. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Jana. There it is. You are in the zone, Jana. You you know exactly what needs to be done here. And it's one of those things where you work so quickly and efficiently that you sort of step back and look at your handiwork and you look at the clock. You're 12 hours ahead of schedule. Well, um, I think I'm going to go spend some time on the holodeck, maybe get a nap. I don't know. Um, um, we... So is it just out of game. Do we have the ability to to sort of take either tack that we want with this, like to yes. convert the isolatics into metaphasics? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so everybody, I guess, take five. This is uh, this is truly wonderful collaborative work, everyone. This is exactly what Starfleet is all about. Different species working together in unity, bringing together our individual skills and synthesizing them in order to do the impossible. Right? We have an artificial life form, a cation, a human, and a Tellarite. This is, it's, uh, it's really heartening. I think I'm going to start crying. Uh, All right. Well, before you do, I'm just going to go. That, where's, your, where's your sense of the celebratory spirit? I mean, should we go to like Penthouse and have a drink? I will go to you. Uh, I will go to Penthouse and have a drink with you gladly. But lieutenants, I will point out. This is my happy face. Duly noted. But I will say that's also the face that you make when you're arguing with people. He's never happier than when he's arguing with people. Right. This, you know, Jaro, when you came on board, I really didn't like you. That's okay. I still don't like you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, let's let's go and and have a drink. And you know what? Uh, I'm buying, but we should probably be responsible. We are going to have to deal with this on the ship in about twelve hours. Send the hall only, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Athena, would you like to come with us? I mean, I know that you, it might be insensitive because you can't drink. So if that's a thing for you, I apologize. No, no, I um, I kind of want to see what this whole drinking thing's about. Don't really understand it while you can why you why does meat need to drink? Well, one of the one of the best aspects of drinking uh is just social interaction. Mm. Mm -hmm. So is, you can you can kind of just hang out with us. It is uh, an excuse to be together. It's not like I have anything else better to do other than comb through personal logs, so sure, I'd be happy to come along. Have you found anything yeah, interesting in those logs? Or... Stay out oh, of my yeah. Logs. Did you know that uh, a certain Stetco actually, and we cut scenes <laughs> back to the surface of Baku, <laughs> where uh, at this point, um, you know, uh, Gulna has returned. I'm not going to put tokens down for him, but Gulna has returned with... Uh, several other uh, Baku. Uh, they also look, you know, they don't look a day over 40 kind of a thing. Um, but uh, Golna introduces them to you. Uh, this is Artem. Uh, he introduces to his left and to the right. That is Solja. Thank you for meeting with us. I know that our presence is unexpected and quite possibly frustrating. However, um, I'm not sure if Gona has explained it to you, but the Sona are looking to attack again and their reasons for attacking are continuing to be related to the revenge they once sought for being expelled from this, their home world. Now, and, uh... I... Go ahead. No, I was gonna say Artem just sort of nods and says, "Yes, he's he's explained it to me, and um, 
I'm here on behalf of my father, uh, so Jeff. Uh, I believe between the three of us uh, and yourself, we can talk the Sona down. That's great to hear. Um, you would be a hero, Galna. Well, it might actually make me feel like I've made a difference after these many years. I don't understand. Oh, let's just say that some time ago, the whole reason the Enterprise E was able to do what it did was because I betrayed my superior and helped him do it. You were Sona. Mm hmm. After 40 years, you look incredible. You could be a beacon to your people who have been lost these many years. That's my hope, yes. Um and and you're all you're all okay with offering a place for them to resettle. In a sense, yes. I'm not gonna let them settle next door to me, but you know, somewhere nearby. At your discretion, of course. I'm sure the, the lure of their home world will be more than enough for them to at least lower their weapons and begin speaking again. Indeed. Well, since uh, we have a little bit of time before Brictiva can bring us back to the station, might we enjoy your company? <clears throat> and I think Artem just sort of smiles and says, yes, uh, be a lovely drink you'd enjoy. It's a honey combination, or at least something approximating honey. And uh, as long as you two are willing, uh, you are led into a nearby building where you enjoy refreshments and uh, other bits of uh, Baku library. However, uh, it is at this point that we are going to do a little bit of a time skip here. Uh, specifically that we are going to set up that, and I do have to do a little bit of cleanup here, so don't freak out. Uh, so we're going to do one of those things where everybody ends up back on Deep Space October um, in their appropriate positions uh, approximately 30 minutes before the Dreadnought is scheduled to show up. Um, now from here, this is where you guys are going to be the stars of the show because there's so many different ways you can take this. Um, so just as a point, GM, um, mm -hmm. I don't think we were going to deploy the Val. Okay, you're taking care of it as we speak. Yeah, I, I just got to do a little cleanup, yeah. Sure. Um, and Brictiva has returned us to the station. No problem? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, the only thing that happens is once she transports you back, uh, she more or less says, I'm going to sleep now, and then just sort of crumples on the spot and goes to sleep. Um, have the hollow emitters on the bridge produce a soft, plushy place to sleep. Nice big old bean her. bag. There you go. <clears throat> uh, so we're 30 minutes before the arrival. Dun, Correct. Dun, dun. Anybody feel like this is too easy? Like GM is spending threat behind the scenes. We're all going to die <laughs> anyway. That's what I'm feeling in my hearts right now. <laughs> Have faith <sighs> of the heart. Hard. Dang it! <laughs> Drill's Sock gonna be em. laughing so hard. <laughs> Sock em. Uh, um. So everybody's gonna be on the bridge, mm -hmm. and uh, Kiswick will be addressing everybody. All right, everybody. Um. This is Sojef, Artem, and Galna from Baku. They've agreed to speak to the Sona as envoys as needed. We'll let their internal deliberations manifest however they can agree upon. The goal, as it was, is the same. Stop the Sona from initiating a rift that will 
tear this sector apart. Dodig, report on the weapon. Well, I'm pleased to report that with the expert help of Lieutenants Jana and Terrell, the weapon was completed in just over 12 hours. Um, every simulation we mocked up showed it to be approximately 86% effective. That's incredible. 12 hours. So you guys have had plenty of downtime. Good job. All right. Well, we're going to do this a much different way. Let's see what happens. And of course, the dramatic appropriate time has passed because at this point, uh, emerging out of a subspace aperture is that Sona Dreadnought from before. As they uh, initially started, they have weapons charged. They're not currently aimed at the station, but the weapons are more or less ready to fire. Now, Stetco, oh, go ahead. Stetco, let me know if you feel anything really terrible from them. Open a hailing frequency. Now, GM, you were saying? No, what I was going to say is that this hail, uh, this is where all the marbles are going to come out. So complication from it earlier. No momentum. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. So the complication from earlier is that let's just say your lightning rod works a little too well, meaning that if any phaser fire is direct, like if any energy oh. weapon goes near the station, the deflector is going to eat it, quote unquote. So you have that complication on the field. The other threat spend complication is that the Sona are not initially willing to talk with you. However, because you went to the planet, went to Baku, and you got advisors, you now have the advantage that such a talk down is possible. However, with my remaining threat, I'm going to make this probably one of the difficult roles you've made in your career, Kiswick. This is going to be a presence command. It's going to be a difficulty of six. Ooh. The complication range is a 17 to 20. I believe in you. This one is for all the marbles. And in terms of assist, you get one assist. That can either be the station, can be any member of the senior staff, can be Athena. Or if you really wanted to, it could be one of your uh, Baku. But I would just tell you the Baku don't really have nice stats um that's okay i think that i can make this work mm -hmm. uh stetco if you want to back me up with Hi, uh, sir. interstellar law politics <clears throat> mm-hmm Welcome, Sona Vessel. My name is Captain Kiswick of Deep Space October. I understand that it's been a long time since you've seen home. You've no doubt scanned the station by now and detected three Baku life signs. Perhaps some of them you'll know well. One of whom was Sona in his past, and he went home. And today he th he's thriving. He no longer needs the use of any metaphasic radiation or any of the previously barbaric techniques to stay alive. They're here because they're willing to extend forgiveness to you. You can go home. You have this opportunity now. Discharge your weapons. Let us speak of this. Let's reunify your people. And let's heal the wound that has lingered far too long. Discharge might not be a good word. <laughs> Let her go. Drops her out the building. Bad <laughs> choice of words. Uh, you said presence command? Presence command. Difficulty of six. Am I rolling this too? Uh, you're rolling a presence command as well, but you're assisting, so just the one die from you. Okay. 
Um, can you use determination and challenge of value at the same time? You certainly can. This does. Um, okay. So I'm going to chat. Go ahead. Well, the only thing I would say is that remember you have veteran. So it might be something where you spend your determination, see if you get it back via veteran, and then challenge a value if need be. Um, yeah, I could do that. Or I could challenge my value and save my determination for somebody else. This is true. Uh, that would give you two points of determination to sort of hold on to. That's nice. <clears throat> now, challenging the value, that adds to my role, right? No. So if you challenge the value, what happens oh. is you cross out that value and you replace it at the end of the session. And that gives you a point of determination. So instead of having one point of determination right now, you would have two. Oh, okay. Well, I might actually need both of those and that's fine with me. <clears throat> I'm going to challenge the value friends in high places. Mm -hmm. And instead, sometimes you only need to count on yourself. Okay. So that'll give me that second point of determination. Mm -hmm. um, and then I will spend it okay. for this roll. I so don't you start have... with two free successes. Yep. I don't have any momentum. Could give me threat. I could. How much threat do I give you for two dice? For two additional die, for a total of four, uh, you would give me five threat. Everybody here okay with that? What's the worst that could happen? Let's go. <laughs> Let's we this. already have. We've already had the worst. So, all right, five threat on the counter. I'm ready to assist, sir. I've got four. All right, your assist will be needed, and I'm going to have. Can I use leadership as a focus? You certainly may. And I'm using Federation Law and Politics. Yep. Okay. But you're assisting, so do you get a focus? Yeah, yeah, they get a focus. Just if one die. Yeah, it's just the one die that they get. All right. All the marbles. Oh, I did spend a point of determination, so I might be able to roll a challenge dice to see if I get it back. Mm-hmm. You do okay. not. So it's probably a good thing you spent uh, to challenge that value because you might need it. Yeah. <sighs> okay, those are very good rolls. Uh, so that is a total That's of seven. seven on the table right now before an assist. However, that zero is a complicated... Okay, we're at nine successes with the assist. Uh, but that 17 is a complication. So you can either keep the complication... Or you can spend your other point of determination to re-roll that. Entirely up to you. Spend it. Um, I will spend that determination, and I will roll a challenge dice to see if I get it back. All right. I do not. Do not. And so uh, to re-roll that, it's just one more presence command or something? Yeah, mm -hmm. just one more presence command with uh, just the one, one die. dice. Right, okay. Not a complication. Uh, do I still get a focus on it? Yeah, still get a focus. Okay. Nice. You convert it from a <laughs> oh, uh, critical failure gosh. to a critical success. So I think it's one of those things, Kijwick, where you, of course, say this uh, inspiring speech. And as Terrell says, maybe discharge wasn't the right word. Um, it's at this point that uh, Artem sort of speaks up and says, listen, it's been many years we can't understand what you've gone through. But as the captain has said, this is a time for healing. Destroying others, destroying our way of life, destroying the way of the Federation's way of life isn't going to accomplish anything. So please, depower your weapons. Let us talk about this. And then there's that tense moment where everybody is probably looking at readouts, just what the hell is going on at the Dreadnought. Uh, maybe to the point where Hatea off in the corner is like sweating bullets, whether or not she should have been on the Umbriel this entire time. Then uh, in Ensign speaks up and says, sir, sir, they're, they're, dis they're well, I'm not going to say discharge because that's the wrong word. They're, they're depowering. They're, 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 they've not, they're powering down, sir. 
the collective exhale depressurizes the bridge or repressurizes the bridge, I'm sure. Any hail? They wish to speak to Artem specifically, sir. Um, should I pipe it anywhere in particular? Let's go to my office. Stadko, you're with me. All right. So uh, I think that's honestly a good point to end the session because after this, it's, uh, it's a bunch of politics, which we could do, but politics are hard on the brain. So, but yeah. Uh, that's going to be end of the sort of little Sona arc that we had there. Uh, what did people think? I, I know the beginning was a little bit odd, but I did want to throw you guys a little bit of a curveball there. Something a little bit more interesting than, oh, well, let's just keep blowing up the station kind of a thing. No, I really liked it. I felt it was very Trek. I, I did too. Um, yeah. It's been an interesting culmination of the old man arc, and I'm interested in seeing what more uh we bring for that um as somebody who knows a lot more about arthurian legend than kishwick does i was like gritting my teeth going i want to know these things uh, that was uh that was a cool that was a cool thing yeah now of course the, to find the out true... what the the new uh the new guest brings to the table and and we've got to find out uh Athena's favorite person, and we mm -hmm. have to find out what uh, Stetko's personal log said. Oh, that well, I'm just going to let hang over people. <laughs> she's been reading Stetko's personal logs. You think that Stetko would be your favorite? Mm hmm. Well, you'll just have to tune in and find out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I'll be sure to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this is where I say goodbye to YouTube. Twitch, stick around for a little bit longer. But YouTube, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you later. Bye, YouTube.